So welcome everyone to the high energy uh, seminar for the week. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. James Mott uh, from joint appointment with uh, Fermilab in Boston University. So at Fermilab, he's a Wilson Fellow and he's uh, currently adjunct assistant professor at BU. Uh, so over the next year or so, I think he will be transferring completely to uh, Fermilab. Uh, his research is on uh, the muon G-2 experiment, which is the topic for today, and he's the analysis coordinator for the experiment, um, and that's, that's a very impressive uh, title for, for such an experiment. Uh, previously, he was a postdoc at Boston University and uh, also a research assistant professor there working on G-2 and a little bit on mu to e um, and he uh, received his PhD from University College London, and he was working on the NEMO-3 uh, double beta decay experiment. So we're very happy that he uh, joined us today and uh, look forward to the seminar. So James, take it away. Thank you, um, and thanks for the invite, and uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm just gonna send a, a link in the chat here to like a PDF version of the talk that I'm gonna give. Um, it's missing videos and not quite complete, so encourage you to to not look at that one and look at my one instead but um if if you want to click on a link or if you zone out for a few minutes and want to catch up then then you've got some version of the slides okay um has this come up in in the right form you can see this okay looks good okay great um so yeah thanks for the invite here um it's a real pleasure to talk to you guys today um about the, the first results of our G-2 experiment. It's been a long time coming, so it's nice to actually be get up to uh, give a talk with a number at the end rather than just promising a number. Um, so I'll just start off the talk by briefly going over what, what the uh, muon magnetic moment is and why you might care. Um, so, so the G in G-2 is a, the Landé factor, um, and it determines the spin precession um, frequency in a magnetic field, right? So it, it's basically the, the G here is what couples the spin to the magnetic moment. And if you put um, this magnetic moment inside the magnetic field, you're gonna generate a torque and it's gonna process around, right? Like this cartoon of a top. Now, if uh, the only thing that existed in the world was this one Feynman diagram, um, then uh, from the Dirac equation, we know that G is exactly equal to two in this case. Um, but what we uh, know in reality is that you can draw other diagrams such as this one here, and where you've got virtual particles in these loops. Um, so here I've drawn them as, as X and Y. These could be standard model particles, right? If X was a muon and Y was a photon, then this is just a first order QED. Um, but they could also be new physics. So the idea here is that the, by measuring this precession as this thing uh, goes around and in the vacuum, you get all these particle antiparticle pairs. Um, they change the precession frequency. Um, and by measuring it precisely, uh, we may be sensitive to, to new physics here. Okay, so why would you actually care about that? Well, the nice thing here is that we can precisely predict and measure this quantity, right? That's the thing that makes this um, particularly special. So the idea here is we, we take this uh, precise prediction and precise measurements, and then we compare the two numbers. And then the whole point of the experiment is to ask if they agree, or is there something that we see in nature that isn't in the standard model? So at the bottom here, I've just scattered a, a few different options. Um, obviously there are ones that are missing and you can pick your favorite of what you think might be missing from the standard model. Um, but you know, there could be dark matter candidates, Susie's um, still alive and well in, in some parts of the phase space. Leptoquarks, for example, recently have, have had a bit more attention with the, the result from LHCB, the RK result. Um, but there could be something altogether lurking as well, right? Some other monsters lurking in around here in this, in this propagator. Okay, so um, this is the standard model that we need to precisely compare against. So I just want to spend a, a few minutes explaining where that number comes from. Um, so we, we're indebted as an experimental collaboration to this um, consortium of 100 the theorists, which uh, make up this muon G-2 theory initiative. So this really sort of got going in 2017 and they've had a few workshops when you could still get together and they've had a couple of virtual ones since. Um, and what they've done is compiled all the theoretical inputs and they provide recommendations as to what the, um, the theory predicted value for um, G minus two is. So there's, they've got this nice white paper here with a link here, and this is all the authors there. Now, what, I'm, what I wanna get across here as well is our, our collaboration agreed a long time ago that um, we would just use whichever value 
uh, the, the muon G minus two theory initiative recommend, right? They're the theory experts. Um, so they, they give us the number and we compare with that. And um, we wanted to avoid anything where we sort of pick and choose our favorite theory to move um, the discrepancy either larger or smaller. We just use whatever they tell us. So um, the following numbers in this talk are all the values that, that come from, from this white paper in, in the theory initiative. Okay, so what actually are the, the value, what is the value of G and where does it come from? Well, I said before, look, this is the Dirac equation. From that, G is exactly equal to two. I'm going to factorize out the two, um, which you'll see why in a minute, but that's out the front here. So that comes with no uncertainty, right? It's just straight from the Dirac equation. Um, the first correction, which is the largest part by a long way, comes from QED. So this was back in 1947. There was an observation that um, the electron G deviated from two at the level of kind of one, one in a thousand, point one percent. Um, and this then led to Schwingen um, saying, okay, this could be to do with a, a radiative correction from this photon, um, which we now know as, as the like, first order QED. Obviously back then it wasn't known as that. Um, and roughly what you find here is that this is equal to alpha over two pi. So this number actually isn't too far away from alpha over two pi. Now, since then um, there's been a real, um, a real challenge to the theory here, which is, I mean, this number, how, this QED term now has been calculated to extraordinary levels of pre precision. So it's now out to fifth order now, um, there's 12,000 diagrams. So here's just a selection of them here. Right? When you start seeing Feynman diagrams that look like this and think people have calculated this, it's, it's absolutely crazy to me. And so, yeah, these are the kind of uh, the diagrams that get calculated. And so you end up with um, this really, really small uncertainty um, coming from this, this large number here. Okay, so after QED, you then have a term that comes from um, electroweak uh, interactions. So th the first order has been known for a long time, um, and the second order is well known now, but it wasn't easy to, to get the second order calculation here. Um, and in general, this number is obviously much smaller than the QED number, um, it's like 154 versus uh, 11 million here. Um, and the uncertainty is still pretty small on it. So. So the lecture week is, is just there, it's done. Um, we don't have to worry about it too much. Now, th where things get messy, um, as always, are when you start putting hadrons into the mix. Um, so they've got these much larger uncertainties here, showing at the bottom, 18 and 40, compared to these negligible ones over here. Um, and this is just because of uh, the non-perturbative nature of QCD, where we can't calculate these very well. So you have two terms here. You have this light by light, where you have three photons going and interacting with a blob. Um, and then you've got this hadronic vacuum polarization term, which is uh, where you've just got a hadronic blob in the middle of this propagator here. So this, this one's quite large, right? 6,000, and this is only sort of 100 um, in, in these units. And so this is, um, but the uncertainty on this one's, um, fractional uncertainty is quite small um, because the number's large, this is still a uh, size of uncertainty. So most of the effort of the theory initiative has been to try and control and reduce these uncertainties. Um, and it's, it's gone fairly well. So the, the light by light historically was difficult. Um, it, it needed some modeling, significant modeling, um, but, but there has been recent progress on this and there's now a, a data-driven approach um, where there's kind of this dispersive approach here um, and you can um, flip around data in a clever way and you basically come up with this number. Um, and the good news here is that, that that was able to check the previous use of the models, for example, with Glasgow consensus in 2009, um, compared to the updated number here. These numbers are in agreement um, and, and it hasn't moved and all these methods uh, are in agreement here. So, so this is the number that comes out. So this one's settling down and the uncertainty is reducing on the light by light as, as time goes on. Now, the, the real challenge here then is this hadronic vacuum polarization term. It's much larger. Um, so the way that this is um, historically been calculated um, is, is using data from um, E plus E minus collisions going to hadrons. Um, and it just kind of in a hand wavy way, you can see that this, so this um, blob in the propagator here is this one here. Um, from anal analyticity, um, which is just causality, I think. So um, you can show that, that you get this integral and the imaginary part of that. Um, and then the optical theorem um, tells you that you can relate this this part here to um, basically the the cross section of um, photons going to, to two hadrons. So if you plug all this together, you end up with a relatively simple form um, where the leading order term of this um, vacuum polarization is just some integral with a, this kernel functions analytic. We know this, 
Um, and then you have to plug in these data-driven measurements of R, where R is the ratio of um, hadrons over muons. Uh, James, may I interrupt with a question? Yes. So when you do a sum over hadrons, um, how, what, what, go, what goes into the sum? Or, or is it incorrect to think about the, the, the mesons and baryons and so on? Uh, yeah, so it's so it's this this is the data that goes in there, right, in this plot down at the bottom here. So this would be the R value here. So it's coming from all these different experiments, all these different experimental results. Um, and then in general, they're exclusive channels, right? So it would be it's dominated by this yellow bit here, which is the pions, just because you know this has got a one over S here, right? So so down here, this is the bit that really dominates the turn. And so there's measurements that come from um Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to say which one it is now here. Um, but the, this pion calibration, um, I suspect they all measure it, right? And so, so that there's many different measurements there. Um, and then these theory groups um, come together and uh, make sure they take care of all the uncertainties when they're combining these to come up with this R value that then plug in here. Okay, but for, it looks like charm is is negligible, but they're, they're, or or impossible to. Yeah, so well, so okay, so this is there's data at this point. So this plot's missing further bit up here, right? So there becomes a transition as well where you move away from using the data to using um perturbative QCD as well. So that's not that far above this threshold of this plot. Okay. Um, Got it. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Thanks. So so where you can't use it then then we end up using the data, but there's some transition and, and different groups transition at different points. Okay. Right, so that's um, that's how this has traditionally been done in the past. Um, and the current recommendation from the theory initiative is based solely on that data-driven approach. Um, but things are, are changing in that world. Um, so you will have probably seen this calculation that came out. It actually was um, published in Nature on the same day that we released our result. Um, and so these calculations from Lattice QCD are also starting to become interesting, right? So the this value over here is the, based on these two data-driven approaches. Uh, this is the one that went from the theory white paper. So that's over here, um, you know, the, the Brookhaven measurements over here. So there's this discrepancy. Um, and then all these blue ones here are lattice QCD results. So you see that they used to have uncertainties which were too large to really say too much, right? I mean, you can see like, for example, this one here, you're kind of covering everything with this uncertainty. Um, but when you then, um, look, and now just with this latest result from this BMW collaboration that came out recently, this is the first one that's um, reaching sub percent precision, right? And it's intention with, I mean, it's intention with both, right? It's intention with the standard data driven methods and also intention with the experimental result, um, but it's bridging the gap between them. So this is systematic um, dominated in terms of its uncertainty. And so we need to watch it closely. It'll be really interesting to watch what's happening over the coming year as to whether or not um, these other groups can match this number and, and confirm it, or whether they land somewhere else. So, so at the moment, we're watching this closely, um, and I just flag it up here as an, as an area of interest to watch over the coming year. Okay, so that's that's the kind of story of everything that's gone in here. Um, so in that, there are these terms here. Now, all of the new physics is in these parts. And so instead of talking about G, we'll talk about A mu, um, which is just G minus two over two. So Everywhere else now, I'm going to move away from talking about G to just talking about A mu instead. So you can take the number, the final recommended prediction from the, the white paper from the theorists there, um, is this value here. Um, and that's good to 368 parts per billion, um, which is a slightly better precision than, than our result here. We're at kind of 460. Okay, so um, where, where did we stand before this new result? So the, the previous experimental result that was the best one came from the Brookhaven experiment. Um, so that was E821, it ran around the, the turn of the millennium. Um, and uh, historically this has been well known, right? There's a difference between the standard model prediction and uh, the Brookhaven result. Um, and that was at about 3.7 sigma with this updated theoretical value. Okay, so you've got in here, this green band is showing the experimental result. Um, and then this red band here is showing the white paper result here. You can see, and then versus year, right? So the standard model prediction hasn't really been moving very much. It's certainly not been charging towards the experimental value. Um, so, so that's kind of stable where it is with the, the caveat from the previous couple of slides. Um, and then this is the result here, um, um, which had a precision of 540 parts per billion. 
Now, this discrepancy has led to an awful lot of speculation over many decades now, right? So this is the number of citations per year for the Brookhaven result. It kind of is about 250 a year, um, and it's remarkably stable over, over the, the time. So the questions that we have to ask ourselves now is that was this discrepancy here a sign of new physics? As the vast majority of these papers are uh, people saying, here's my new model, and uh, this explains the discrepancy. Um, there could be a mistake in the theory, and the theory initiative is drilling down and trying to understand that. Um, and we watch and, and wait to see what happens with the lattice QCD. Um, but what we're really trying to address here with our experiment is this third one, which is a mistake or a statistical fluctuation in the previous experiment. And so the, the main aim of our experiment at Fermilab was to set out to confirm or refute this Brookhaven experimental result. So the collaboration here is um, for this experiment is shown on this picture. There's about 200 of us. We come from 35 institutes in these seven countries. Here we are at a collaboration meeting in, in Washington. Um, and we, we make up a, a broad breadth of, of physicists in the collaboration. And we draw from many different areas of physics in order to do this measurement. So we've got particle physics, nuclear physicists, um, AMOP people, uh, accelerator and, and theory physicists as well. And we're all working together towards these goals, um, of these precision goals at the bottom. So, and Brookhaven is here, that was 540 parts per billion. This first result that I'm telling you about today is 460 parts per billion. So we've done better than Brookhaven already. Um, and then the final target for this experiment is down by about a factor of four from where we are now, which would take us to 140 parts per billion. And then I've also just included the, the same. I mean, we measure this, this is our measurement precision. If you wanted to then convert it back into GMU, this would be your precision on GMU. And um, if you wanted to go from the parts per billion to claim something in the parts per trillion range. Okay, so where is the experiment? It's here at Fermilab. Um, so for those of you familiar with Fermilab, here's the high rise and the, the canteens in here. That's um, where all the magic happens. Um, we've got a good spot, not too far from the lunch hall. So we're over here in, in the G minus two building. So this is the muon campus over here. And then there's mu two E, this is in this building here. Um, and then this is the old um, anti-proton uh, ring, um, which is now our, our muon um, target and delivery ring. And here's the Tevatron, Chicago's over, over there in the distance. So that's, that's where we are. So um, what goes on in that building um, is this, this measurement we make. And the principle of it is to store longitudinally polarized muons in a storage ring with a vertical magnetic field. Okay, so if you do that, they're gonna go around and the spin's also gonna turn. Um, so if you do that and then consider the difference between the spin and cyclotron frequencies, so this would be the spin precession frequency. So you've got the standard Lamour precession here. This is um, just the spin turning uh, with G from the magnetic torque. And you also have a term from Thomas precession and this is a relativistic correction. So that's the spin precession frequency. Um, and then we know the cyclotron frequency as well. We can just write that down here. Now, if you imagine taking the difference between these two um, while you're in your ring, now if G happened to be exactly equal to two, then what you find is these two are actually exactly the same. Everything cancels out in here. Um, and in that case, if you injected a muon <clears throat> and its um, momentum was going around here in a circle with the cyclotron frequency, um, the spin's going around exactly the same frequency, and so it's always pointing tangentially, right? So you just see um, them go around and around and around, um, and the spin would always point um, in the same direction as the momentum. But I've told you before, G is slightly larger than two, and so if you plug that in, what you find um, is that this difference frequency between them then becomes proportional to A mu, which is G minus two over two, and the magnetic field and some constants. Right, so this is now means that the spin precession frequency is slightly larger. Um, and so as your muon goes in, the spin just slight, starts to creep ahead of the momentum. Right, so if you imagine sitting on a detector here, as these muons go around and around, the spin's gonna point inwards towards you, and then it's gonna point outwards away from you, and it's gonna point back inwards towards you. So you're gonna watch this spin oscillate inwards and outwards, um, and that's gonna be happening at this difference frequency, omega A. So this is the whole principle behind the experiment, right? Is we measure the difference between these two frequencies, um, omega A, um, and then we measure the magnetic field, B, um, and then we take the ratio of those and use it to extract A mu, right? So this is the, the thing that we then compare with the theory. Right, so where do you find a, a big magnet like that? Well, thankfully there was one that wasn't being used in Brookhaven anymore. Um, so we transported it in one piece because it, it didn't come apart, the, the super coils. 
Um, so I, I assume you've always seen uh, this kind of journey before and some pictures from it, but um, I'll just flash, flash some quickly here because it's nice to see them. So we started up here on, in Brookhaven on Long Island and he went down the barge down the coast, avoided some hurricanes around Florida, um, chugged up here and then came up the Mississippi. And um, here it is going through the Arch of St. Louis. Um, and then uh, here's the final part of the journey on these calls uh, as they go through a toll booth um, on the journey to Fermilab. Um, and then finally, just for scale, here it is installed and here's our collaboration um, that came to this, this particular meeting um, inside there for scale. So this is kind of the scale of the, the magnet. Um, you can see from this one in the, in the bottom right. Okay, so um, before getting too stuck into data and things, I just wanted to give a tiny bit of orientation about what you actually really see. So this is a picture that um, was splashed around a lot um, when we announced our results. It's kind of the picture everyone uses. And so what I wanted to do was just talk through um, the different parts of, that you can see in the picture. Um, and try and uh, orientate you a bit of what, of what you're actually looking at. So um, we start off up here. Um, I, I'm just starting where the muons come out of the hole in the wall here. It's obviously a huge accelerator complex that does magic to try and uh, get, get these, these muons to us. Um, but they come out of this, down this beam line here. Um, they're made from protons that slam into a target. These, we collect the pions that come out the other side um, and then they decay um, to polarized muons, right, coming from the parity violating pion decay. Um, they go around the delivery ring, which means more pions decay, and we can also separate out the protons. Um, and then finally, we end up with these bunches of muons that come, the three GeV muons that come out the hole in the wall and come into our ring. So these arrive every 11 hertz. Um, so yeah, so we get 11 of these a second. They come in, uh, they go around and around and around to decay, and then we get another fill, and, and they go around and another fill. Right, so it's kind of pulsed in that, in that sense. Okay, so that's the muons that are coming in. Um, they go around inside our magnet. So this is 50 feet in diameter. Um, it's a field of 1.45 Tesla um, and it's C-shaped and it's a backward C here. So what you're looking at in this picture would say be a slice along that white line there, for example, and then looking in this direction. So you see this um, big iron yoke, which is around the outside. The muons live here. Um, and then we have these superconducting coils um, which flow current in these directions. And if you convince yourself with your right hand rule that you're gonna get a field that's gonna go around here. And then there's all sorts of little shims and wedges and things that can move in and out to try and make the field here as uniform as possible. Right, so we've now got a, a magnetic field and we've injected our muons. So they're coming around here. Now, if you did nothing at this point, then they're just gonna carry on going around in a circle, right? It's just a vertical magnetic field so far. So they're gonna go around here um, and slam straight back into the pipe that they came out of, right? So, and then you're gonna lose all your muons. So you don't want that. So what we do instead is they come through here and they start to turn. And then when they get to this point at three o'clock, we have a magnetic kicker, which fires. So you can just see some cables that come down and go in there. It's a plate, it's two plates that are like this and we flow a, a large current quickly through them. It generates a, a field like this one here, so shown in black. The red here would be our, our time profile of our injected beam. Um, and then these blue lines are separated by one turn around the ring, which is 149 nanoseconds. So the idea here is that we have this field that comes up and down really fast. We kick these things once and just change their direction ever so slightly. And that's enough for them to go here. So instead of going around and coming back down, we've just tweaked this outwards ever so slightly. Um, and now we come around and we're nicely centered in the aperture. So we go around and around inside the aperture. Now we haven't, you've got them going around inside the aperture at the moment, but we haven't done anything about any vertical orientation. So obviously they'll have some vertical momentum when they come in. Um, and so we need to contain them. So we do that with these electrostatic quadrupoles. So they have four plates that look like these ones here. Um, and we put um, potential on them such that there's a, a quadrupole field and we basically squeeze them vertically. So they then squeeze down um, and there are four locations that cover just under half of the ring um, around there. Now the muons themselves are gonna oscillate around inside this field um, and they undergo basically simple harmonic motion as they go around. Um, and I'll show you later how the muons swim around in, inside these focusing fields. Right, so we've got muons and we've stored them and they're going around, but we want to know about their spin. Um, and we do that by looking at the decay positrons which come off them. So say you're a muon and you came around and you came to this point and then you decayed. Um, you've decayed to a positron and a couple of neutrinos. So the positron doesn't have the momentum from the neutrino, so it'll have lower momentum than muon and gonna curl in. So it then curls in 
And what we use to detect it are these calorimeters, which you can see here in blue. So the positrons curl in and we measure them inside the calorimeters. So they're the main work also the experiment, that's where most of the data is. Um, but we do also have some other systems. Um, the other system I'll tell you about today are these two trackers. So we have a tracker here and then another one you can't see under the stairs. And so these are straw trackers, which tell us about the beam profile and from where the positrons came. Okay, so the last piece of orientation I want to do is just a timeline. So you know what it looks like in, in time as well as space. Um, we, we moved the magnet in 2013 and built the building in 2014. The first real kind of physics activity um, was to shim the magnet to make it more uniform. That came in kind of 2015, 16 time. We had our first run, um, commissioning run, where we found out how much stuff didn't work in 2017. We fixed that all and then got ready for run one, which was in 2018. So this is three and a half months of running time. Um, and then since then in 2019 onwards, we'd, we're now in run four, right? Every year we've had a run and we're still taking data now. So what I'm telling you about today is this data from run one. It's actually only a very small fraction of our total, only 6% of the expected total. But even with just that 6%, um, it's high enough statistics to give us 15% higher precision than the Brookhaven result. So um, in total, we have these 8, 8 billion positrons here um, above uh, our energy threshold. And later you understand why that's important. Now, um, there were four different data subsets. It's not particularly important that you, you understand why they just had different um, quadrupole and kicker settings. And so we had to spit them out and analyze them separately and then combine them. Um, I just tell you that there were these four data sets here because some, some plots later will have um, them broken out. And so you just need to be aware that they exist. And then the last piece of information on the time is that we released this first result from this data on April the 7th. And so three years after taking the data, we had the result. Okay, so what do we really measure? Um, so I said before that we have AMU, it's proportional to this precession frequency in the magnetic field. Um, the proportionality constants are all shown here. We measure this ratio, so omega A, and instead of measuring a magnetic field, we measure another frequency. That's the frequency um, from precession of, pro of protons in water um, weighted by the, the muon distribution. That's what this omega p tilde prime is. So our result for, from this one here is 460 parts per billion. And our final goal is to go to 140, where we split roughly equally between statistical and systematic uncertainties. Now, this, this is only going to be possible to propagate through to AMU with any decent precision if we know these constants well. And thankfully for some great um, experiments from our other experiments, we do know these. So these proportionality constants here are known um, to less than 25 parts per billion, where the dominant uncertainty is coming from this mass ratio of um, the muon to electron mass ratio, which is known to 22 parts per billion and um, from this muonium hyperfine splitting experiment. Excuse me, James. Yeah. I'm trying to understand where the protons and water comes into play. There's no water buckets in your experiment. No. So um, we, I, I'll, can I, can I carry on and uh, we'll come of to course. it. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, and then once I think I've explained it, I'll ask you whether you think I've explained it as well. Got it. Okay. Um, and basically we need to do this compared to water because this, this one here was in water, right? This, this measurement here, um, was measured with water, pure water as well. So to be able to use this ratio from this experiment, we also have to make our measurement at the same reference temperature and with water. Thanks. Okay, so um, there's the three ingredients that we need, right? um, as well as those constants. So we've got the one on the top here, this precession frequency. We need to know what the magnetic field is, and we also need to know where the muons are within that field. So I'm just gonna walk you through these briefly, um, just to explain what they are and how we measure them. So starting with the magnetic field map, um, this is omega p prime. So I showed you this magnet before. Um, it's, it's still the same as when I showed it to you before. Now, um, we wanted to get this nice and uniform in this field. So we had this shimming campaign um, from 2015 to 2016. Um, and at the end of it, we ended up with a nice uh, uniform field. It's only 14 parts per million RMS um, around the azimuth. Um, and it was three times better than Brookhaven. So what I'm just going to show you here in this brief video um, is the progress of the shimming over time. So this is the dipole field strength up here. So this is a huge scale, right? 1400 parts per billion. So, um, and then the blue line here is, is a typical result from Brookhaven. Um, and then the red is the starting point for Fermilab when we first turned the magnet on um, and took the measurement, right? So we, um, this is without any adjustment of any of these shims or all these different pieces. 
this is just the starting point. So um, I'll just start this video and you can see immediately we start moving stuff around to make it more uniform um, and you can start flattening this out fairly quickly. Now where we were different here, I'll just pause for one second. And um, so uh, if you just look over here, right, we're kind of similar in terms of the variation compared to Brookhaven. Um, and this is, this is the point where Brookhaven stopped in terms of the, the shimming. Um, but what was different for Fermilab is we had these tiny um, iron laminations um, of, of like micron thickness um, iron sheets that we stuck on all over the pole pieces to make this much more uniform. And you can see, right, so this, at this point here, and we stuck the laminations on at this point and this point, and you can see they're much flatter now. So if we then carry on right to the end, um, you can see that the red line over here, the excursions of the red line are much smaller than, for example, these, these larger excursions from the, the blue line. And so overall, like a more uniform field just makes the whole experiment easier because you don't have to worry so much about where the muons are and measuring these uh, sharp peaks, right? It's much easier to measure it if it's flat around the ring. Now I said we've measured these um, fields. So how do we actually go about making the measurement? Well, we have this NMR trolley. So it lives inside the vacuum um, and we, we drive it around every three days um, and it maps the field. So um, it looks like this, it's like a huge Coke can, a Red Bull can, I guess. Um, so it's long, so the probes are up this end and then the electronics are down that end. So there's 17 of these probes, the NMR probes that, that sit up here. And so these probes are actually um, measuring, um, they use petroleum jelly. Right? So we're still not on water at this point. So these probes here are measuring with petroleum jelly and they measure the proton um, precession frequency um, via NMR. Now this trolley moves around inside the, the field and at each point, um, it takes 8,000 points around the ring. Um, and at each point it makes a little field map like this um, and makes these contours based on the measurements from these 17 probes. Um, and then what we really care about is the average around the ring, right? Obviously a muon swimming around, it's gonna see all the field. So you care about the average around the ring. And so I've just shown you a typical plot here from, from that sort of average. And you can see the variation in general is much smaller than one part per million. This, this red line up here would be one part per million. And most of the muons live here in the middle. Um, so, so the overall variation um, around like that you have to know where your muons are inside this field is, is small. Now, so we've now know what the field is in terms of the precession frequency of petroleum jelly. Um, oh no, sorry, I've skipped a bit here. So yeah, we can't keep that trolley inside the ring when the muons are present, right? If you put the, the muons uh, in there, they're just gonna slam into the trolley and you'll lose the whole lot. So what we do instead um, is monitor the field during this data taking with these probes. So we have these 378 probes that sit like in this picture here above and below the ring. And so they look like this. The trolley obviously isn't there when the muons are, but this is just showing where you would be in comparison to the trolley. Are those hall probes? No, these are NMR probes as well. Okay. Yeah, these are the same, same NMR probes. Um, we need them for the, for the precision as well. So these are the same, um, they're identical basically to these probes in terms of the petroleum jelly NMR probes. So the idea would be that you, you measure with the trolley run um, at one point and then you, you take the trolley out and you take data and then using these probes, you kind of follow where the field was going and it went up and down and up and down and then you took your other trolley run here and you know, okay, so this is actually where it went in between these two trolley runs. So obviously if you just had the trolley data and you do a straight line here, you're gonna miss these excursions of what the field's actually doing. So this is just one example from one trolley run pair at one location around the ring you obviously have a lot more data than this um, to try and interpolate between them. Um, and also this was particularly bad in run one and run two because uh, we didn't have control of the temperature. So this is why this kind of looks like it's varying even more. There's like a day night oscillation in here as well as, a, as an overall drift. But, but the trolley must be giving you something that you're not getting from those top and bottom probes, even though they look really precise. Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, the you've obviously got higher multiples here as well, right? Like there are changes in the field that you can't easily pick up with six probes like this. You can only go up to certain multipoles. You're gonna miss other changes from there. Um, and then on top of this, the trolley calibration is more precise. Um, and this, there is some, so this, this kind of by definition have to match up at these ends because you anchor this um, at this end and this end as well, right? So um, there's actually the, most of the uncertainties here in the middle um in, in the way you interpolate these this this data here got it so the y-axis on this plot for the trolley is just the average but it actually has a lot more information is, is that what you're yeah yeah exactly exactly okay, so you, as well as just knowing the vertical dipole field you okay. know like how much was the field changing i mean like it's all in in this data right there's all these different multipoles 
you can see that are, are going to make this these different shapes. So um, we we've now measured this this in terms of the petroleum jelly, um, but we cross calibrate because we need to get to water. So we have this plunging probe we call it, which is a cylindrical probe with with pure water in it. Um, and basically what we do is we put it inside the vacuum and then we take it out and then we put the trolley where it was and we keep swapping places and we calibrate all of the different probes of the trolley um, with this calibration probe. Right, so then we've transferred the frequency from the NMR probes on the trolley to this water probe. And we take that probe then and take it over to this MRI magnet that we have at Argonne. And we check that against a spherical probe, which has even smaller systematics. Um, and then this probe here is the, also the one that goes around and is used in different experiments around the place. So some of those other fundamental constants that, that we were comparing against as well ended up using uh, the same probe and everything's cross-checked against it, making sure there's no offsets. So the final cross-check that we've got as well is this helium-3 probe. So it's got different systematics compared to the water one. So this was developed for the experiment um, and, and these all agree. So the final uncertainty on the field um, from the calibration, from the, the mapping, the interpolation, everything like that, comes out at 114 parts per billion. So it's, it's relatively small compared to the, the total of the 400 that we have at the moment. Um, and it's pushing down on the, the systematics that we're aiming for. Right, so that's the magnetic field. And um, next I wanna talk about the muon distribution. So obviously you can know where the field is very precisely, um, know the field incredibly precisely, but if you don't know whether the muons are like up at the top here or in the middle, then it's not much use to you. You need to know what the, the field that the muons actually see. So you need to know where the muons are inside your field map. So you measure that with these, these two uh, straw tracker systems, and that's sort of seven and 10 o'clock in the ring. Um, they are made up of these tracker modules and the straws, um, 128 straws per module. Um, and so if you're a muon and you were going around inside the ring, this is what you'd see, you'd be going around in this storage region. And maybe you're a positron and you bend off to the right hand side and you, you go through these different straws um, and you'd leave a track. So it's kind of like Hawkeye, um, if you're a tennis fan or a cricket fan like me. Um, so if you, this is a slice through the vacuum chamber. So what, what you have there is your muons will be going around in this green line. You've got the detector systems on the inside. So maybe you're a positron and you decay on the inside, you go through the tracker, you leave some hits. Um, and then from there, we can then reconstruct a track. And um, so this is, I mean, all, all just normal tracking, right? And where we go slightly different is we don't have a vertex or anything like that. So what we do is we extrapolate backwards to the point of tangency. So you extrapolate back until your radial momentum is zero. Um, and that gives you a good proxy for where the beam actually came from. And you can also then extrapolate forwards to the calorimeter and do systematic studies uh, where you match, for example, the momentum and timing from the track with, with that from the calorimeter and make sure you understand everything there as well. So you can then do this for many different positrons coming through and you build up a map of what the, the muons look like. So this is, we call this the avocado plot, because it looks like an avocado. And so, so here you're seeing the radial position and the vertical position. This is just a slice through the azimuth. Um, this is what the tracker sees. This is basically where the beam is. Um, so it, it's slightly shifted to the right. Um, this is because we couldn't kick as hard as we wanted to in, in run one. Um, but as long as we know where it is, that's not a problem. Um, and then here is the same data, just overlaid with the field contours. And so you can see how they line up. Um, and you can see, yeah, we're basically in this region here where it's we're, the majority of the time we're in this region where it's um, nice and uniform. Um, and there's only a small, small uh, amount of data that ends up in these points where you've got large gradients. So, so to get the final number, we take the average of um, basically this field map weighted by this distribution, and that gives you the, the magnetic field that you see. Now, this is just overall time, um, but you remember before I mentioned that the quadrupoles cause the beam to breathe and swim. And so that's what you can see in this if we start taking time slices of the tracker data. So this is uh, creeping up in time since injection. And you can see this is the beam breathing back and forwards. So these are beta tron oscillations of the beam. So up here in the top right as well, I'm just taking the mean of this distribution and the width. And you can see as the beam uh, moves back and forwards, right, you see this, we can measure this really well with the tracking system. Um, and this is just standard beam dynamics. We know, we know why this happens and things, and um, we can make all sorts of measurements of this to make sure we understand what's going on in the ring. And this will become important later on when I talk a little bit about the precession frequency analysis. Is it possible to remove those oscillations? Would you want to? Or? 
Yeah, so they so they do decay over time. Um, so they go they go down, but they go down quite slowly. So yeah, and they do cause a systematic effect. So um, they're particularly large during this run one data period because um, of the kicker problem that I mentioned before. Right, if you kick harder, then then this goes away, and the amplitude roughly halves. So at the moment, if you made this plot from the data we take now, then the oscillation is kind of roughly halved in amplitude. Um, but it, it's still there. Um, it's it's kind of immovable because of trying to get through a small hole um, to get inside the ring, basically. Um, it's kind of, you just end up with this phase space mismatch. So you have to model it or in, in your- Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically sinusoidal. And so, and, and it comes okay. in, in terms of the acceptance. So yeah, okay. we just have to modify our fitting function to take into account, to take this into account, yeah. There is also a plan uh, afoot now, which so maybe for the next run as well is, is to put RF on the quadrupole plates and if you time the phase right, you can you damp this out right, and you can just get rid of it. So we'll see whether or not that would be kind of a game changer. Um, but you know, we're also a little bit scared about uh, changing what we're doing at this point in the experiment. So we're still looking at that option. Oh, now I see they are decaying. The scale is getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> yeah. Oh, these are these are the neurons decaying in time. Yeah, and then the the oscillation itself here, right? It's starting off like here. It's like I don't know. Uh, 14 millimeters and by the end of the video it might be down to 10 or something oh okay it's got a lifetime of about 100 yeah. microseconds now the time around the ring is only a few hundred nanoseconds right so so this yeah. is, yeah. this, is, this is a slower slower uh, frequency mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay so um uh, plowing ahead here onto the anomalous precession frequency so this is the numerator now uh, we measured these with calorimeters on the inside of the ring there's 24 of them around there. Um, you can see a picture of one here. So uh, here's a, a kind of computer generated one where you've got this cart that slides in um, and you can see this is the same calorimeter here. It's kind of six inches tall. Um, and then an array of 54 lead fluoride crystals. They're kind of one inch by one inch by six inches, which I've been in the US too long. When I've, I've got centimeters on the slide and I'm talking in inches. Um, but the, uh, these are these crystals here. Um, they're, they're read out by the silicon photomultipliers, um, which is slap on the back. Um, and we digitized these, these whole things at 800 megahertz. There's about 1300 channels. And then we do our pulse fitting offline. Okay, so um, I kept telling you that we were measuring the muon spin, um, but I then also keep telling you that we measure decay positrons. So it's worth a brief interlude just to explain why decay positrons tell us about the muon spin. Um, and as before with the pion decay that gave us a polarized beam, nature's kind to us here too uh, with parity violation. So if you imagine that um, you've got some muon decaying here um, and you wanted to just think about the highest energy positrons, well, they're gonna go back to back with the neutrinos, right? So the two neutrinos are coming off in this direction and your highest energy positrons are going in this direction. Now, what you find is that if you do all your spin arrows as well, and your spinning muon was pointing in this direction, these guys, uh, cancel each other out in terms of their helicity and their spin. Um, and basically what, what happens here is that the highest energy positrons are emitted then in the direction of the muon spin. So we can look just for these high energy uh, positrons and then we know where the spin was pointing uh, by looking at those. Now, I, I told you before that this was pointing in and out towards the calorimeters. And so this is what you see if you're at a calorim calorimeter, um, as the spin points towards and away from the calorimeter, as it's going around, this energy distribution rocks backwards and forwards. Um, and, and then the number of high energy positrons that you see oscillates. So the simplest form of the experiment you can do here is just a cut and count. So you just put a threshold in and count the number above the threshold. So that's this, this number shaded in black here. And you could plot that fraction here and it's just showing that it's just oscillating. And it's oscillating at the omega a difference frequency. So this is basically what we do. We, um, we actually wait, but um, you could also cut and count and you see this oscillation going on. Now um, that's a cartoon, but here it is in real life. So this is our data from run one. Um, so these are just four different analysis, analyzers and four different, slightly different techniques with different reconstructions and things. Um, but generally um, it's just nice to see the data and just show how nice and clean it really is. So what you're seeing in these plots then, so this is time on the, the x-axis and this is the, just a histogram of the number of positrons that are arriving. Um, th these plots wrap around, so it goes from here and then wraps around and then wraps around. 
And so the slope here is the exponential decay of the muons. So over time, they're just decaying away. And then the oscillation that's on top of them is that um, precession frequency oscillation where the energy spectrum is rocking backwards and forwards. So you've got an exponential decay and then an oscillation. And the idea for us is just to measure the frequency of this oscillation. Now, now the simplest form that you can imagine for fitting a plot like that would be just an exponentially decaying oscillation. So that's a five parameter fit that looks like this, right? With the exponential decay and then an oscillating term here at some frequency. And you know, if you fit this, it doesn't look terrible by eye, right? It's pretty good actually. It fits the data pretty nicely. Um, but you look at the chi-squared and it's terrible, right? It's actually like two, the chi-squared over the number of degrees of freedom. Um, and then if you take a, a Fourier transform of the residuals, this is what pops out. And you see this whopping great peak, which is at the radial oscillation frequency. So what's happening here is that the beam oscillations are coupling to the calorimeter acceptance. So when the beam's closer, you see more. And when it's further away, you see fewer. Um, and so there's another oscillation on top of this, which is very small and you can't see it by eye, but it's in here. Um, and so they, they therefore change the number that, that we detect. There's also a, a peak here, which is kind of hard to make out. And this is because the exponential decay isn't perfect. So we actually lose some muons from the storage ring before they decay, um, which means that, that if you just fit with this, this one exponential, you get it wrong. So, so we can correct for both of those. We just add these terms into our fit function to deal with those nasty complications. And we go from a simple form here to a slightly more complicated form. And um, it looks kind of daunting, but there isn't really all that much in it. We have this term here, which um, corrects for these lost muons, these muons that are lost before they decay. Um, so we just measure, measure the loss rate with the calorimeters and there's one parameter for a scale factor. And then these other terms here are for these oscillations, right? These um, beta-tron oscillations. So that's what these all are. Um, <clears throat> each one of these is, looks, is a term that just looks like this. So you um, just have an amplitude, a lifetime, um, and then a frequency and a phase. They're just, so, so each one of these is just a, a small modification of the normal five parameter function. So when we talk about these fits, we say like, oh, it's a 22 parameter fit or something. And you might think, gosh, how could you ever believe a fit with 22 parameters? But it's just because every time you add in another one of these oscillations, then you, you have to add another four parameters in for an amplitude, a lifetime, a frequency, and a phase. And so you end up with actually just a few effects. And then you end up with quite a lot of uh, parameters quite quickly. Okay, now, um, would, does this work? Well, if it didn't work, I won't be telling you about it. So this is the same plot as before for the simple five parameter fit. And then you add all the extra terms in and you go from the black line down to this red line here. So all these peaks in the residuals disappear and your chi squared becomes good. Um, and then these are all consistent. All these distant oscillations here are just consistent with some noise. And it's important to get this right, right? So the actual extracted frequency changed by 2.2 ppm. You remember we were talking like um, five times smaller than that was our precision that we're, we've got for this result. So we, you really do need to get this right. And it seems like a big number, but you know, this is also completely crazy as well as a chi-squared, right? You're never gonna think that you're, you're doing it correctly when you have this kind of um, chi-squared. Now, so a good residual spectrum like this and a good chi-squared are necessary, um, but they're not a sufficient condition to know that you're doing things right. And so there are other systematics that we have to deal with. And so for example, here um, is, is one of the main causes of that. This is a time dependent phase. So, so what, what's happening here, um, if you just take your five parameter fit, um, and you change this phi here to be time dependent, then what you find is that your oscillation term here, if you just Taylor expand this, you're gonna get terms like this, right? With a linear term. And then if it turns out that the higher order terms are small, then actually what you measure, this thing here looks just like your ordinary oscillation, except instead of omega a, you're gonna measure omega a plus phi prime. So if this second, these other terms are small, you're still gonna get a good chi-squared and you'll never know that you've messed up your omega A measurement. So these are the kind of things we really have to worry about. Now there are these three issues that cause this. There's the beam oscillations that I've uh, told you about before. And time we've got these under control with those models and the uncertainty from this comes down to around 40 parts per billion at the moment. And that's based on just tracker, di tracker data and beam dynamics modeling. Um, there's two other systematics here. So there's one from pileup. And so to try and explain why this is, could be a time dependent phase, right? Just think about these two positrons here, low energy, these soft positrons, they show up at the same time here and they just look like one high energy positron, okay? And high energy positrons in general are coming from further away. And so to go from here to here, you've had more time in the magnetic field. 
So they'll have a different spin, therefore they have a different phase. Okay, and, and then this spin here, so these, this pile up is gonna happen much more early on in the fill where the rate is high than at late times. And so as you go from early to late, you're gonna have a change in the average phase. It's a similar thing that goes on with the gain change, right? When you blast the, um, the calorimeters upon injection of the beam, um, we have a load of beam and positrons and, and they come and give the calorimeters a good whack. Um, and actually the gain sags by up to half a percent from there. It recovers quickly. And by the time we start the analysis here at 30 microseconds, it's very flat, but we still have a dedicated laser system that measures this change and we correct for it. And we end up with an uncertainty that's small, so 10 ppb. Okay, so once you've done all that correction um, for those systematics and you know what you're doing, you can start looking at the actual results. So what I'm showing here is, is a relative unblinding for all of the different analyzers. I showed you some before. There's six different um, analysis groups. They're all independent. And here we're just showing the, the difference that they get for their final omega A value. Um, <clears throat> they're using the same data. So they are, they're very correlated, um, but there are different techniques and they have different systematic uncertainties and they are, they're not exactly the same positrons in, in each plot. So, I mean, I can't go through this all, there's theses worth of details that go into each one of these measurements. Um, but so you just have to trust me that all of these are consistent within their expected variation. Um, and basically the take home message here is that it doesn't really matter which one of these analyzers, which result you took from them, um, you'd get the same answer in the end, right? Six people did it independently and, and you basically get the same answer. Um, and then the statistical error from this that comes out is the dominant thing that's at 430 parts per billion. Right, so there are three ingredients and we're doing pretty well here. Um, the, but unfortunately, the real world isn't quite so kind to us. Um, and we do have these small complications to get the final result. Um, these are the three ingredients that I just told you about. Um, but the complications come in from this calibration factor for the field. So that's, that's to do with the plunging probe. We have another factor that comes in from our clock blinding, which I'll explain shortly. And then we have these corrections over here. Um, so we have some that come from beam dynamics. So these are to do with the electric field um, and vertical motion of the, the muons. Um, and then some from these lost muons and then some from this phase acceptance effect, which I'll explain briefly in a moment. And we have also some changes that come from uh, magnetic fields, some transients from the kicker and, and quad vibrations too. So you might look at this and start to get scared and think, oh no, now you need to know these to part per billion level precision. Um, but the, the experiment's well designed such that these corrections are actually very small. So the total correction from everything here is only 550 parts per billion. And you know, the statistical error is 434. So we don't have to have the same precision requirement on these, these things at all. You know, like even if we just need them to 10%, then we're, we're in good shape. So um, I, I don't intend to go through all these numbers. I just wanted to flash them and show um, we've spent lots of effort going through and getting these corrections and getting them right. Um, these are the ones from the numerator. These are the same values from the denominator. And all these come from these papers. So if you're interested and want to go and try and dig down a bit deeper into what all those corrections are and how we calculate them, then I encourage you to, to read through some of these papers. Um, they were all released at the same time as our, our result. Right? You have the, the main PRL, this one for the precession frequency and this PRD. We have this one for the field. Um, and then we have this uh, PRAB for the corrections, the beam dynamics corrections. Okay, sorry, I'm rushing here a little bit. I'm, I'm a little behind time. Let me just grab a quick drink of water. Okay, so to save you going through that paper right now, um, here's the uncertainty table from the PRL. And this is the final table. So I just want to call out some things from here. The, the overall uncertainty was 462 parts per billion and only 25 PPB of that came from external inputs. It's completely dominated by the statistical error at 434 parts per billion. Um, and then the systematic error is 157 parts per billion. This is, this is actually very good. Um, it's nearly half the systematic from Brookhaven, um, but we're not quite yet at our 100 part per billion goal. Um, and I'll explain briefly why that is in a second. Now, the, um, if you look at the correction terms, these two here are the largest, um, these two from well-known beam dynamics effects. Um, and then if you look at the uncertainties, these two here are, are the largest, um, this phase acceptance correction and this um, quadransient effect. So these are the two large uncertainties here that are really what's messing us up and stopping us from getting to our 100 part per billion goal. 
um, and, and they're the ones that dominate. So um, I'll just very, very briefly talk through these numbers here um, and why we expect them to get smaller and why you should believe these corrections. So um, for the E-field and, and pitch corrections, these being dynamics ones, um, what I showed you before uh, with just the difference frequency is, is a very simplifying assumption of um, you know, perfectly vertical fields and, and uh, magnetic fields only. But if you go through and do this properly, then you need to use this BMT equation to, to talk about the spin motion. This is just straight out of Jackson, this equation here. So if you squint, you can sort of see, all right, fine, looking here, you've got, this is the momentum and the spin, so the angle between them. And then here you've got an A mu and a B. So you can sort of see why you're gonna, you're gonna end up with A mu is proportional to omega over B. Um, but then we have these other terms, right? We have this one from the electric field. And so what's happening here is um, the, the focusing quadrupoles field, um, as the muons go through them, they, they experience a motional magnetic field in their rest frame from a Lorentz transform there. And that affects the spin precession. Um, so we are careful with our muons. This is why we do it at 3 GeV. If you're careful, then you can pick a gamma such that this term cancels, and then the whole thing goes to zero. Um, but unfortunately, not all of these muons are exactly at P magic, right? We're always going to have a spread. And so there's some correction that we have to factor in. We, we measure the muon distribution using timing data for the calorimeters. You end up with a distribution that looks like this. Um, and, and the final correction has kind of a 10% uncertainty on it. So it's been known about for years, this is not surprising and it's large, but it's well understood. And the pitch one just comes uh, from, from this term. Um, so the muons are oscillating upwards and downwards. Um, and so B and beta are not um, perfectly perpendicular. So this term is then reduced. Um, and you can imagine, you know, higher angles uh, mean more width uh, in the vertical distribution and smaller angles mean narrower width. So we can basically extract this correction by measuring the vertical width of the beam using the trackers. That's what I'm showing here, the data here in these black points. So um, we measure this width here and you use that to, to get this pitch correction. So that comes out um, smaller than the e field correction and, and we know it pretty well. Now, uh, the other two corrections here, um, I'm going to, I'll talk through this one and then I think I have to skip the other one, I'm afraid I've run out of time. Um, so the, the quad transient effect here. So the problem we have here is that the quads are, are charged and discharged every fill. So um, you basically put um, high potential on these plates um, and then you discharge them. And when you do that, you get some electrostatic forces between the plates and the vacuum chamber. Um, and this causes these plates to vibrate ever so slightly. Um, and so the main challenge here has just been measuring these vibrations and, and how they affect the magnetic field. So we made this special probe, everything's made of plastic here, so you can put it inside this electrostatic field. Um, and it basically rides on these rails, which are these rails inside, inside the vacuum chambers. Um, and if you do that and then make this measurement, you find that the field is, is a complicated mix of the resonant frequency of the vibration of the plates and the driving frequency. So what you're seeing here in these gray lines here in time are the muon fills, right? So this is each time you put muons in the ring. Um, this is the 11 Hertz that you're, you're coming and seeing here. Um, and then the, the oscillations you can, you can make out going uh, up and down here. And then you stop driving and you can see it starts to decay away. Now we're relatively fortunate um, in terms of, if you zoom in on these, that basically the gray lines are nearly always when the field is relatively close to zero, right? You don't, we're not ever like at these, these big peaks. Um, so that, that's, that's fortunate. And basically what we want to do is, is take the average of what the muons are seeing when they're inside the ring here. So we've got these measurements and we just need to know how the field is changing when the muons are inside there. Um, now this, this correction comes out to be small just because we got lucky basically with where they landed. Um, and you average over these eight bunches um, and there's 43% of the ring has quads. So these things end up with it only coming out at 20 parts per billion, but it's got a large uncertainty and that's just dominated by not having a complete map um, of these, these kind of field measurements all around the ring going back to run one. So we have to do some extrapolation. So um, in the end, we're gonna um, make more measurements basically. Um, and this will reduce by a factor of two or three for later results. Um, I'll skip this other correction here. Um, it was just to say that this basically was driven by dodgy hardware during run one, and we fixed it during run two, and the whole thing disappears, basically. 
And so the take home from, from these systematics is that we'll make better maps and we'll fix those resistors that with the dodgy hardware and a few other improvements and that we're well on track for our systematic goal of 100 parts per billion um, in the future. Right, so the final thing I need to tell you before getting to the, the meat and bones of the actual final number is the blinding. So um, our, in the previous equation, I had the corrections and then also this F clock factor. Now this is the frequency that our clock ticks relative to 40 megahertz. Um, now it's, it's not that we just bought a, a dodgy clock that doesn't tick right. Um, it's, a, it's a good time piece, it's stable at the part per trillion level. Um, but what this is is the exact clock frequency was set by these two, um, these two of the directorate. And Greg Bock and Joe Licken came and, and set this clock frequency. And instead of 40, they actually set it to 40 minus delta where they were the only people that knew this delta. Um, and then they locked up the clock um, and the value of this delta was kept secretly until the analysis was completed. Um, so basically we effectively are redefined the second in our experiment. And unless you know what your second is, then, then you're blind, right? So um, our virtual unblinding happened. So when, this is back in February now, and we all got together virtually. Um, this is the whole collaboration here. You can stare at everyone's face. Um, and we had a unanimous vote that we were done with the analysis and we were ready to open those secret envelopes and get our final result. Um, and this is how it, it shakes out. So this plot here is showing the um, theoretical prediction over here. This is the recommended value from the G-2 theory initiative, the standard model. Over here is the Brookhaven result. And um, so this was 3.7 sigma away. Now throughout all this reanalysis with different people and different equipment, we didn't actually find anything that would significantly change this Brookhaven result from, from its value there. So that stays where it is. Now our result comes in here um, and we find that it's consistent with Brookhaven um, and our uncertainty is 15% smaller, right? Um, we're 3.3 sigma away from the standard model with our new result here. Now, both of these are dominated by the statistical uncertainty. That's up to these ticks here. And we don't know any of any correlations between the systematics between the two experiments um, and there's good agreement. So it's safe to just simply combine these. You can do that. And then you come up with a new experimental average um, from combining these two. And that one comes out to be 4.2 sigma away from the standard model between these, these two values here. Okay, so um, the, that result was announced on the 7th of April um, at webinar. So one of the good things about COVID is that we could have many more people than can fit inside the Fermilab auditorium. There's 8,500 people attended. The theory community has been incredibly quick off the mark <laughs> with this. We're already at 111 citations for this result. We're only five weeks later. And um, it's almost like they knew it was coming. Um, and then as well as the theory community, uh, we also had our, our day in the sunshine um, for physics here. So here we are on the front page of the New York Times, um, European news sources, uh, Chinese and Indian news sources. Um, and never mind the news as well, even Luke Skywalker was paying attention. Here he is, Mark Hamill, um, commenting on the result. And the one I find particularly terrifying is, is a YouTube video uh, with Mugly Muggin. Um, and there's 300,000 views, and which, of which no more than 10% can be my parents. Okay, so that's, uh, that's me wrapping up now. So we've measured AMU to an unprecedented precision of 460 parts per billion. Um, this result that I've told you about today has only got 6% of the final data sample. It's got 15% smaller error than Brookhaven. Um, and it's got a 3.3 sigma tension with a standard model on its own. Um, after 20 years later, we've confirmed that the Brookhaven result um, by measuring something compatible with it. And if you then combine the two, you end up with 4.2 sigma tension with the standard model. Now going forwards to the future, it's looking very, very bright for G-2. Um, there's so much more data still to come. We're here just at the 6% that I've shown you today. You can see all this big white space, which we can fill up. Um, we've got this new data um, from run two and three, that's 2019 and 2020. Um, it's about four times the data from, from run one in total. So we'll um, expect to halve the error and we're aiming kind of next summer would, would be our target date to release that. And as I told you, the systematics are on track for less than 100 parts per billion. Um, as well as our main G-2 result, we'll have an, an EDM search um, and also searches for CPT and Lorentz violation should come out around the same time. Um, and then we're still taking data. So here we are as of um, yesterday. Um, this is the positron still coming in. We're in run four at the moment. Um, we've got another run in run five. Um, and we're aiming to end up at sort of 20 on this axis in the end um, with about one quarter of the the current error as our final value. 
but that's everything. Thank you, and sorry I went slightly over there. Hey, thank you, James. Excellent talk, uh, very comprehensive. Um, let's open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, any, any from the students before we open it up to the rest of the audience? Feel free to unmute and ask away. Okay, students uh, don't have any questions, others? I have one, um, sorry, light is on me. Uh, I appreciated in the, the paper, the discussion about how the experimental average was obtained um, using blue, B-L-U-E, mm -hmm. but I'm also really very well aware of how unstable the actual average is with respect to tiny changes in the error bars. Well, the tiny changes in the correlation of those error bars are how, and I didn't see a, a long discussion about that in the paper. In other words, if you change the um, correlation values, the central value there moves a lot. Um, can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you can do. Um, yeah, I think I, I don't have a slide on it or not. I think I did have something about this. Sorry, uh, this is an awful, oh, here we go. Yeah, okay. So um, in terms of, this is just to kind of fill in about blue and, and how this works, yeah. right? So when we're combining the different data sets, um, this, is, this is what we minimize basically, right? Where this is um, each of the data set results compared to the average um, and the covariance comes between them. And, and you're completely right, using this blue thing, it becomes very unstable when you end up with this critical level of correlation, right? So um, you end up with each of these um, values that you're putting in here is so correlated with the others um, that if you get that ever so slightly wrong, you end up with like negative weights for them and it just blows up and goes horrible on you, right? So um, in the end, uh, what we do is set all the correlations to be the, um, the critical value um, themselves and then also take the different reconstructions and weight those. Um, equally as well. So in the end, actually, how it falls out is nearly, oh, I'm not going to have it now, um, is nearly a, a straight average of just the asymmetry weighted results, right? So some of the results do have 10 to 15% higher statistical precision. Um, and so if you do the normal combination result of those, then, then basically all the weight goes to them and the other ones just get dropped anyway. So we just drop them by hand and say, okay, let's not even worry about that. Um, and then you have these basically four numbers that you're trying to combine, um, one of which has slightly different statistics to the other three. And so we end up just like weighting one of them by half and the other three by a sixth each. But it's, it's the correlation coefficients assumed for some of the systematic errors that could have a, I, I know you're totally dominated by statistics, but. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, at the moment it's, it's so dominated by statistics. Um, compared to the the other things i mean yeah so so the it, it's fiddly you're completely right and um the only thing is that we tried a lot of different combinations of yeah. the stuff and i mean at the end of the day you're sort of combining four numbers um that are basically the same yeah, yeah. value anyway and so there's there's some part of the collaboration where you kind of think like oh gosh i mean just Let's just take a straight average of all these things, right? They're the same number and doing the same well, thing. That, that, I'm, when there's correlations, that's a dangerous thing. But okay. Yeah. Just wouldn't, yeah. yeah. So very nice talk and uh, very nice result. You're going to speculate wildly? On, on new physics or yeah. a mistake? Oh, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I'm excited at the moment, actually. I was really in, encouraged to see the um, the kind of the RK result from LHCB coming out at sort of the same time as well. It's sort of like a, a three sigma hint again there. And I don't know, this, it's, it's certainly giving these uh, BSM theories something to shoot at in terms of uh, a few different things where yeah. constraints them from different sides. So we'll that, see. That was so cool that several, several exciting uh, novelties, right, that came out close in time. Yeah.
I have a question about the five parameter fit. I don't know if you want to scroll back or not. I know that it's it becomes more than a five parameter fit, but if I counted those parameters correctly, then you're you're actually fitting for the lifetime of the muon instead of using the PDG value. Is that correct? Yeah, we fit for the lifetime of the muon here. Um, it, it comes out consistent. Um, there's so you're. I mean, you could. Will, will, you, will you get the world's best muon lifetime out of this experiment? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, you, you have to know the momentum spread very well, right? Um, I think we have to know the momentum spread to know what the, I mean, this is actually a gamma tau, right? It is what it should be, right? This is the, this tau in this bit parameter is dilated already. So you need to know what that gamma is very well. And I don't think we know it well enough. I think in the, the old experiment, actually, they did, they did a, a good job and actually did end up with the best for a while, but then the Mulan experiment came along and oh. blew it out of the water, I think. Okay. Well, uh, I could, you I could have some period. effective lifetime due to some other losses too. So. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing as well. You'd have to measure the losses. You hit. You hit an atom. that's you know inside your backing pipe, and that that's another way muons can go away. But presumably that could be fit. Yeah. So so we try and take this into account with this this loss term here, where it's measured. But yeah, we'd have to measure this probably better than we really can. To uh, to be certain about this this lifetime here. The other thing as well, I mean, so this lifetime here isn't particularly correlated with the frequency. It's correlated with n and tau, and, and actually there are techniques um, where you end up taking ratios of different shift time shifted data, and then this thing cancels out altogether. So it doesn't it doesn't really affect our our final precision or anything. It's not particularly a problem for us to just shove it in as a fit parameter. So in the last millennium, when I was on the Brookhaven version of this experiment, there was actually a little discussion about not only using mu plus and mu minus for correlations and, and systematics and so on, but also to inject clockwise versus counterclockwise. And uh, I guess it's just impractical. Uh, has that ever been discussed for the Fermilab experiment? I don't, I, well, the, the mu plus and mu minus has been discussed. And I think yeah. as we were looking before, um, we've got plans to try and squeeze in a, a mu minus run um, if there's there's a way to do that. But no, injecting the other way, I, I don't think can be done without a lot of beamline. Right. So I don't think there's a way to put it. Just... I had a question if there's still enough time. Go, go ahead, Bob. So, um, so famously, of course, the mass of the Z would change slightly with the phases of the moon um, in LEP. And um, due to gravitational tidal effects on the... Uh, on the um, on the accelerator, right? So, and uh, but there are other things that happened. Um, I've seen um, el uh, atomic electron dipole moments change with the passing of the BART by LBL. Um, so presumably, you've listed everything. Uh, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is you know, have you looked at your result during the day and during the night because you know, atmospheric pressures are different. The frequency of of commercial power is different at night during the day on average, and Presumably, you sliced and diced it as many ways as that. Uh, you know, the, the the so phases of the moon is just one. You're probably too small, but certainly the uh, power does change coming into the laboratory between day and night. Yeah, it does. Um, and like also in this run, it was particularly bad for us for temperature fluctuations day and night because we didn't have control of the whole temperature very well in this first run. So um, yeah, we I mean we sliced in we sliced and diced in basically every way that, that we could think of. So I mean from everything from like each individual calorimeter to um, to day and night to like different slices. Um, there is a whole analysis that we do as well for this. Um, I sort of hinted at it. There's the CPT Lorentz violation search, and that's basically you you look for sidereal variation. So that is looking for a day night oscillation right. uh, analysis, and we don't we don't see anything there. Mm -hmm. So far, and so, yeah, it, it looks like um, there isn't there isn't a uh, any evidence of it. But we've got more data in the can, you know, with higher statistics, maybe maybe something starts to creep out. But certainly, with the statistical precision we have now, we can't see anything. Okay, thank you. When you showed the independent analyses, there was the Q analysis that was a little discrepant, not much, but yes. you, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't mention it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm curious. curious. It's all right, just to chop this off. 
Um, so yeah, this one actually doesn't go into our results. So this is a, a different um, method altogether where instead of taking the calorimeter data and fitting and doing all that. So instead this method um, just basically measures the current in the detectors and stores that instead. So there's no reconstruction, nothing else. So all we're relying on is that higher energy positrons draw more current basically. Wow. Um, and so it's got very, well, it's got some different systematics and why it can be discrepant here and it's fine. And so these ones are basically all using the same positrons, right? But this one here doesn't have a threshold. Um, so it's got much lower energy positrons in there that go right down. Um, and because of that as well, it's diluting the, the oscillation as well a bit because, you know, you've got stuff from 500 MeV upwards in here um, that's, that's sort of counting. And so when, once you've done that, then um, the statistical precision goes down and the, the st statistically allowed variation between them is, um, is much larger. So I think this is only one sigma, actually, the difference between this point and these. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for that explanation. So are there any final quick questions? I, I, I was curious how often is the uh, secret clock frequency changed? The, the blinded frequency, you mean? Each run? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's been changed each run um, so far. And then, you know, we get to the point towards the end of every run where we start having conversations about should we tweak it now and then take some systematic runs or and in the end we never do. So yeah, it's just once per run so far. And now we've got a problem where we're trying to analyze run two and run three together and they've got different blindings. So we'll have to uh, relatively unblind, I think. Okay, uh, let's thank James again for an excellent talk and uh, close the seminar. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in person one of these days. Yeah, I hope so. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.